Good morning, everybody, and welcome to yet another week of Z Learning brought to you by Riverbank Zoo and Garden. My name is Milo, and I am here today to wish you a very happy Earth Week. On Wednesday, this week, on April 22nd, is going to be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which means, of course, us here at the Zoo and Garden are going to be celebrating big this week. So all of our Z Learning features this week are going to have a very Earth Day tone to them with a very cohesive theme of all the different ways that you can get involved even at home during our temporary closure and while you are social distancing properly, we are going to get out there and make a difference even from our own homes this week. Good morning, Tammy, nice to see ya. I have my mask on this morning. I'm gonna actually be joined by a coworker of mine from our education department here in just a second and she's gonna share with us a little bit more information. Good morning, Emily, nice to see you too. Thanks everybody for tuning into Z Learning today. Now, like I said, we are going to have a very Earth-focused week, of course. A 50th anniversary is a big deal, so here at Riverbanks, we're gonna make a big deal of it. Of course, we'll have a big celebration on Wednesday, but today I wanted to kick it off, especially because it's such a, a rainy, dreary day here in Columbia, South Carolina. We're gonna hop right on in to Earth Week with a little bit of frogs and toads. Now, you already might have checked out that caption this morning, but we're gonna ask you to actually get involved and open up your ears to a little bit of our native calls right here in South Carolina or wherever you might be tuning into this morning. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Let's go ahead and head on over here. Right now, I'm actually in the backyard of our Discovery Center. It's a nice covered area, because like I said, it's raining and we didn't want to get wet this morning. And our animal friend maybe might want to get wet, but we decided to keep him dry this morning. Let me go ahead and turn around my camera and introduce you to my friend, Grace. Good morning, Grace. Hey, everybody. Nice to see you. Now, Grace, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about what you do here at the zoo, what your position is, and what brings you to frogs? Yeah, well, I am the education coordinator of school and youth programs, which means if you come on a field trip with your school, or if you have the zoo come out to you, to your school, or if you're a teenager and you're interested in joining our zoo crew or zoo team programs, I'm your person. So, so I have you, a lot of fun. With Grace that. might be a familiar face to a lot of you. Hopefully, we actually have some of our zoo teens tuning in this morning. How much fun would that be? But Grace, you are very actively involved in what we call Frog Watch USA. Now, I really hope that some of you might be familiar with that, but we're not gonna talk about Frog Watch quite yet. Instead, Grace, you have a friend that joined us this morning. Can you introduce us to your animal friend that you brought with us today? Yeah, well, today we have with us a southern toad, and his name is Rich. Now, southern toads are found right here in South Carolina, but they're also found all the way up a few more states north mostly along the coast, all the way out to the middle of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and all the way down into Florida. So these guys are primarily southeastern, and they actually don't really like to go up more closer to Greenville and the mountain areas. There is a little population of them that lives up there, but for the most part, they like to stay anywhere from the sand hills toward the coast because they really love the sandy soil. So Rich here is just hanging out with us. You've probably seen these guys in your backyard. If you've ever gone out, especially I would suggest go out after this rain ends and you're probably gonna see them hopping around, hiding under some leaves somewhere, under a few logs and so on. All right, Grace, I have to jump in here really, or hop yeah, in here, I should on. say. Rich just decided to use the bathroom with all of you tuning in this morning. I was wondering what was going on right in front of us. So you know it's kind of a little foggy inside of his little terrarium right now. That's the way it's supposed to be. Frogs and toads like things a little bit more moist, but evidently Rich decided to take a good old bathroom break right as we were live this morning. So I had to just explain that real quick, Grace. <laughs> Rich has no shame apparently this morning, but he's hanging out in here. So you can see, just like Milo said, there's a lot of moisture going on in there. And that's really on purpose. They like to have moist soil. And that's because he's an amphibian. So being an amphibian really means that you're gonna spend part of your life in the water when you're an egg and a tadpole. And then you're gonna grow up and grow some legs, get rid of that tail, you know, go through this whole metamorphosis process and you're going to turn into a frog. But regardless, they've got this really special skin that requires them to be able to stay moist. Now, that skin is what we like to call semi-permeable. Basically means they can actually get oxygen, breathe a little bit through that skin. 
but that also means that they're really susceptible to any type of pollution that could be in their environment, whether it's in the water or whether it's in the soil. It goes right through their skin. So wow. we like to call amphibians our indicator species. If we see amphibians around, we know our environment's probably pretty healthy. But if we have a lack of them, if you go out to a pond or a creek and you're not finding any, that may be a good indication that something may not be quite right there. Well, we had a, just a question that came in. I love that thing about an indicator species. We'll go back to that actually, Grace. That's such a good point to make. But I had to laugh a little bit. We have another Richard joining in. So we have Rich here. And Richard had a question of how do you tell the boys from the girls? Well, I'm going to tell you it's pretty hard. But the boy toads and frogs, really of most species, tend to be a lot smaller than the females. So if you were to find two around the same age, you'd be able to tell them apart just by size. So littler boys, bigger girls. That's a pretty easy way to tell them apart. And I'm also wondering, since we're going to be talking more about calls and vocalizations, is that an easy way to tell them apart too, depending on how they sound? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would say it's a lot easier to tell a frog or toad apart from each other by listening to them than by actually seeing them. Some of them, like our tree frogs around here, can look a lot alike from each other. So listening is the best way. Now you might actually hear some of them doing their calls in the middle of the afternoon today because they do something called a rain call. When we get light rain, they might start calling. Now, if it's downpouring, they're like us. They're, <laughs> down. they don't be they're hiding either. from the rain, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> but a drizzle like this sounds like a perfect day to call. It would be perfect. But most of the time, you're not going to hear them until after the sun goes down. Perfect. Now, Rich is kind of moving all around. Hopefully, y'all can get a good view. Like I said, it's a little foggy, but... He is kind of heading over. I'm trying not to get too much in the reflection this morning. But good morning, Donna. Thanks for tuning in from Georgia this morning. It's nice to see you this morning. Now, Ella had a quick question. Do they like being in the water or do they like to be in the land? Ah, great question. So toads like to be on mostly moist land. Now, I'm not saying that they won't go in water. They will. But they're not like those big bullfrogs Ooh. or green frogs <laughs> you see swimming around. These guys are going to head to the water for breeding purposes, lay their eggs in the water, typically actually on the sides where it's pretty shallow, and then they're going to exit. So yeah, take a little soak in the edge of the water, but they're definitely not going to go out for a big deep water swim. That's a great question, Ella. I'm so glad you asked. In fact, Michelle was wondering, where are the frogs located in the zoo? We've never seen them before. Well, Rich is actually one of our animal ambassadors. If you tuned in last week for Z Learning, you saw that inside look from our animal ambassador building, and you know where Rich kind of lives most of his days, but he is lucky enough to come out, be an ambassador for his species, and come to encounters just like this. Now, we do have some amphibians that you can find in our ark. You can go inside the uh, the Oh, I always say this Aquarium and Reptile yeah, Complex. complex. You're good. <laughs> amphibians. Am I amphibian and Reptile Complex. Yeah, so if you go inside there, you will find some different types of amphibians in there. And then we did for a while. Now, I've, I've been off site for a little bit, but you could go into the farm, and there was a toad down in the farm if you went inside of the barn. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. Now, Grace, you just mentioned that you've kind of been working off site, you've been working remotely during our temporary closure. Now, we have essential staff that stay here on site, of course, during this temporary closure, but then we have staff that are also working from home and social distancing properly. And now that kind of brings me to this kind of story of Frog Watch USA. You, now, of course, we're gonna let Rich kind of hang out there, but Grace, you actually are coordinator here on site for Frog Watch USA. Tell us a little bit more about that because I was fascinated to find out this morning that Frog Watch USA is still hopping and going even during this global pandemic and our temporary closure. So tell us a little bit more about that program. Well, the great thing about Frog Watch is it's run by AZA, which we are an accredited institution with AZA. And so it being its flagship citizen science program here, it allows you to be able to do some citizen science right from your own backyard or from a local park. Now, because a lot of the parks are currently closed, that means that it is really important that we can do this from our backyard. So typically with Frog Watch, we train volunteers to learn how to identify frogs and toads just by the calls that they make. And you go out about 30 minutes after sunset and you listen for literally five minutes. That's it. <laughs> you sit down, you listen, unless something like a giant airplane or a big truck interrupts their calls, that's all the time that it takes. And I'll tell you right now, during this quarantine time, it's a whole lot easier. There's not as much noise interrupting all those <laughs> That's so calls. true. So you get a good, good listen time in. But you go out and you listen, and they ask that you go out twice a week if you can. 
And so this has been so easy to do because where else are you gonna be? You're, we're in our house, we're in our own backyards, and so it's I a perfect time. step outside. It has been perfect. Now normally we do our trainings on site, and we've already done our on site trainings, but Frogwatch also has an entire online training. And in the past that did cost, but right now I looked this morning and I was super excited to see that it is free. So you can go through the whole training. And if you wanna join our chapter and have me be able to communicate with you about what's going on, we do some Frog of the Week emails, then all you have to do if you go through that training is just drop down your chapter as Riverbanks Frog Watch. And you come right on board with us and you'll hear from me and my co-coordinator, Rachel Kitley, who's out of Saluda Shoals Park. Perfect. Now, Grace, what Grace just kind of summarized real quick all about Frog Watch USA for our chapter here at Riverbanks is kind of almost, let's say it's an extension of Z learning with a very e-learning twist, something that you're a little bit more familiar with, of course, because what you can do is you can actually jump online right now, later after our live feature, we're going to send you the link in our comments. So that way you can go ahead and follow that link and actually go through the training yourself to become a call expert for native amphibians, frogs and toads, and actually help scientists identify where those populations are hanging out. Because Grace said earlier, amphibians are a wonderful indicator species. So it's very important for scientists to know where they are, where they're thriving, and maybe where they're not. So by you being a citizen science scientist, this Earth Week, you can help us better understand these very native species. Now, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and give a shout out quick to Sam and Jordan from the communications department. If they wanna go ahead and comment in with that link from UGA, the one that we're gonna actually send in is going to give you a great example of some native frog calls to start listening to. Now, even if you don't become a Frog Watch volunteer today or even this Earth Week, I encourage you to listen to those calls. Start to become familiar with your own backyard neighbors. Who do you share space with and what do they sound like? In fact, Grace, I noticed that you have a couple of other frog friends here. Can you kind of introduce me to some of them and maybe what are some species that we might be seeing or better yet, hearing this season? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we already have a ton of frogs out there calling. They typically start calling around February and they go all the way, well, Frog Watch goes February to August. But I'll tell you that down here in South Carolina, the frogs call even longer than that <laughs> because of the heat. But one of the ones you may be hearing is one very familiar to you. You probably can already identify this. So I'm gonna squeeze my little flush friend here. <laughs> Most of you probably have heard this one before. That's a spring peeper. Now, as well as this is a gigantic plush frog, they're really not <laughs> this big. They're about this big. They are much, much smaller. <laughs> they actually look like this. What a great so, photo. Very small little frog, even smaller than in my photo, quite honestly. So, so these are spring peepers again for all of you that are tuning in. So you kind of hear that peep, peep noise. That's that famous spring peeper call. Yeah. And you'll hear them. You're hearing just one, but the reality is you're going to hear like... 50, 100 of them calling at once. So this evening or after this rain ends, I would definitely stick your ears outside for a second because you will hear these guys going crazy with this spring rain right now. <laughs> Absolutely, it That's is the time of year. Thing. Yep, but the one that we talked about earlier is Mr. Rich down here, our southern toad. He's mm -hmm. also gonna start calling too. So I have a southern toad here for you to listen to. Again, much bigger than a <laughs> southern toad. Oh, what a pretty call. That's kind of like more of that like croaking yeah. kind of rolling call. I love that. Can you go ahead and push it again yeah. one more time for everybody? He makes a trill and that trill goes on for a long time. Now I'm going to tell you that this little guy here, this is a Coke's gray tree frog. He also makes a trill, but when he trills, he only goes on for about two or three seconds. He'll just go and that's it. This is also a tiny little frog. He looks like he's covered in moss and you often will find these attached to your back porch doors and so on, especially in the evenings when it's a little bit rainy. They love to try to catch some bugs over there if you have a back porch light. But those American toads, when he does that trill, as you heard, he trills for a really long time. Or the Southern toads do the same thing. So we've got American toads that look very similar. They live more up into the Piedmont. And then these Southern toads take over the rest of our state and they make that really long trill. So listen for them. You'll probably hear some this evening. You will definitely hear them more and more as summer goes on. 
as we go along through the year, some of the other frogs stop calling because those are their breeding calls. These guys tend to breed really late into the summer, so you'll hear those southern toads for quite a while. Okay, Evan, I love the question that you just sent in. Why do their throats expand? Grace, can you kind of tell us why that iconic frog kind of gulp look <laughs> happens while they're calling? Yeah, so it really depends on the species of frog. Some of them have one throat sac that comes out and that expands with air, which allows them to vibrate everything and make those sounds. Some of them have a dual or a double throat sac where two come out on the sides. And some, like the bullfrog, have this really internal throat sac with that deep yeah, noise that, that they make, really absolutely. So really the sounds they make depend a little bit on what type of a throat sack they have. Great question, Evan, I'm really glad you asked. It also helps to kind of give them a bigger voice because like Grace was mentioning, some of these animals are very small. Rich here is a very tiny little native species but has a pretty big voice. I mean, we're talking all about how much we can hear them and hopefully later today you start to keep your ears open and listening to all of those native friends that we have. Now I saw that Riverbanks went ahead and commented back with that link to listen to those native frog calls yourself. I encourage all of you to click onto that link, give it a little bit of a listen. Even if you don't live in an area where you think you might be hearing some of those calls, talk about a relaxing way to stay at home today while listening to some of our native friends. All right, everybody, I want to give a big thank you, first off, to Rich for joining us today. He didn't have to do a whole lot of work at all, but another big thank you to Grace. Thanks so much, Grace, for joining us this morning for Z Learning. Now, Grace, we're going to go ahead and include those links back to that training as well through AZA's website, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So that way, all of you, if you are interested in becoming a Frog Watch USA volunteer during this period of social distancing, we want you to help become a citizen scientist. All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and turn around this camera. One big thank you again to Grace. All right, everybody. So today, I want you to feel empowered to help make a difference for our globe. It's Earth Week this week. Don't forget so join us for all of our Z learning adventures this week. Even if it's a little dreary and a little rainy, we're still gonna bring you lots of adventures right here at Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. And today was a great example of that. We're gonna throw in all those different links for you so that way you can head in, just look for those captions from Riverbanks Zoo and Garden and we'll get you to the right place. But join us tomorrow morning. We're gonna actually head up to our botanical garden for a very outdoor craft session. Until next time, everybody, I'm Milo, and thanks so much for joining us for Z Learning this morning.